That's good. There we go. Perfect. Okay. Now we know so, who more is. It, it never looked like that before, but welcome to Apologetics Weeks <laughs> Number Six. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, if everybody would go on mute, please. Thank you so much for your help. You guys are awesome. <laughs> it is truly a Monday. And apparently, uh, yeah, it's Monday. So let's go ahead and pray and get started. Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you for this class. Lord, we ask that you open up our understanding that we are able to receive everything that you have for us, Lord God. Let us speak intelligently and have all of the illumination that you want for us, Lord God. We know that you have revealed everything for us in your word. It's up to us to receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, everybody. Happy Monday. Welcome. Week number six. You guys have survived. Um, I will tell you that I have not finished grading your week five papers. In fact, I have only looked at two of them. Um, I will finish grading those tonight. So I looked at two of them. I did not get to the rest of them. I do believe everybody has turned in their week five papers, though. So um, I know it was an interesting topic last week. The two papers I read were actually pretty good. Um, we will um, talk more about that later. Um, did you guys enjoy week five? Okay. Did you all, did anybody, and I will ask this, did anybody find any proof of reformed Egyptian as a spoken or written language? Okay, I see two shaking heads. Any nodding heads? Not outside of Mormonism. Not okay. Anybody find anything outside of Mormonism? Sister Julie, are you nodding your head? Yes. You found something outside of Mormonism to support Reformed Egyptian as a spoken or written language? No. Oh, I okay. Said, I thought you meant did we find material? Oh no. About I'm sorry. I should have rewarded that. Did you? Yeah. Um, did anybody find but, anything but outside? I, I found documentation that uh, it was a fraud and that uh, um, I went into Apologetics Plus, that uh, uh, press, and uh, I pulled the article from there. And it was very, very interesting and went through it in detail about their, you know, he he uh, changed hieroglyphics and thought that because you know it was you know what <laughs> talking about almost 100 years ago now um that people wouldn't didn't know they didn't travel they didn't know about egyptian language hieroglyphics that he could get away with it so an interesting thing about that and i'm glad you point that out sister julie mm -hmm. Um, as we talked last week about cults, um, his yeah. um, story about how he received those golden tablets or those golden plates was eerily similar to uh, the biblical story of Moses and Aaron. Yes. And yes. Um, this is why we say that um, cults are formed because they distort pieces of yes. the Bible. And they yeah. distort Bible stories. And this yeah. one in particular struck me. I mean, as soon as I read that, I'm like, wait a minute, that sounds familiar. Yeah. Yes. Um, and, this and the other thing I found was that he really had no degrees. I mean, here he's talking about starting a new mental health uh, program. And this man has no degrees from any. He, he said he did, but it was all a fraud. Yeah. 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 Um, there's clearly people that do these type of things do need help. Oh and, yeah. Um, well, they're not the kind of people to look for help though. If you think of them as narcissists and sociopaths, those yeah. kind of folks uh, do not uh, blend well with therapy. Well, and Julie wind up in jail is actually that is their therapy. Yeah. Um, they, they need a lot more help than what the average <laughs> person can provide. I'll yes. say. And a lot of times, just from what I have read and seen on TV, I have no personal knowledge. Um, a lot of the people that get caught up in these um organizations and follow 
these leaders um, are lacking something in their lives. Maybe they yeah. want a sense of belonging or they've always been I outcast. I wrote all about it in my included. paper. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> there, there's something that is lacking. Um, there yes. is a wanting and a need. And yeah. a lot of times that's why people come to church, right? Because it's like a type of hospital. People need um, to feel accepted. They need to feel God's love. They need to feel. That's right. right. And if these uh, cults are going to give folks that feeling, then yeah. um, again, this is just based off of what I have researched myself, no personal knowledge, yeah. but um, it, it's quite interesting. And this is why we have to know our Bibles and we <laughs> have to know what and whom we believe, or we will be led astray as well. So we have to be confident in what and in whom we believe. Mm -hmm. So with that said, we're going to go right into um, week six. Any questions about week five? Okay. We are going to, um, I do see the share screen button. You guys, I'm back on track. <laughs> so... <laughs> That's a good way to be. Back on track. Okay. Can you all see my screen? You were blocked. Yes. Yeah, yeah so just a little bit. I can do that on my side. Okay. Everybody see uh, uh, the title slide for week six? Yes? Yes. Oh. Okay. Yes. Okay. Very oh, yeah. good. Okay. Thank you. Okay. This week... We're going to talk about um, a little bit about the proof for Jesus. And we're going to talk about, um, was he the Messiah? We're going to talk a little bit about his crucifixion, the tomb, and his resurrection. Um, we will not go into extreme detail because these we can talk about these topics for weeks. Um, but we're going to go over it a bit tonight um, just to for our edification and to add to our cause of being great apologists. And I did start the recording. Okay. Did I go? Okay. Do other religions testify of Jesus? Well, yes, they do. Yes. Um, absolutely. Absolutely, Sister Julie. Um, I listed two here. Um, Islam. And Islam does acknowledge Jesus as a prophet, not as Christ. And we talked a tiny bit about Islam last week and their belief as um, Muhammad, as Allah's uh, messenger. And they call God Allah. And their um, book, the Quran, does speak about um, Jesus, but it acknowledges him as a prophet. They do not believe in Jesus's deity in that he is God's son and our Christ and savior like we do, but they do acknowledge that he did exist and he was a real person. So that is um, one thing they do. Uh, Messianic Judaism. Also, these Jews believe Jesus is God's son and they believe the Messiah has come in the form of Jesus of Nazareth. And I thought this was interesting. This is one um, type of Judaism. There are several. Um, I am not going to go into all of those because that's not what we're talking about. But we are talking about other religions that testify of Jesus and that he indeed was a real person and did exist and walk among us. This is important because there are those, again, that believe our Bible is a myth and that it is not historically accurate and that we believe blindly. I think we talked about that in week one. Um, there are those that believe that we just believe as Christians, whatever someone tells us and that the book is our Bible. The book is what I'm talking about. Our Bible is full of myths and fairy tales and that we just believe blindly. And that's not true. So Jesus was a real person. He did walk among us, not us here today, but we believe he existed. And we believe that he um, was born and that he was born of the Virgin Mary. Now we talked about this also in week one, that none of us have met Abraham Lincoln because we were not alive back then, but we believe he actually existed. None of us have met Harriet Tubman, but we believe she existed. 
We have never seen her, but we believe the pictures that we have seen portray an accurate or semi-accurate portrait of her. And we could go on and on about other historical figures that are um, noteworthy among us that we have never met, but we do believe they existed at one point in time. And we believe what we have heard for the most part about them to be true. Okay, facts about Jesus. Now, this is important because we do believe that Jesus was born and walked the earth as a human, okay? Um, we know that Jesus was born in the flesh. We have historical evidence that proves the existence of the life of Jesus. Now, we just mentioned on the previous slide two other religions that do identify and recognize the existence of Jesus as a real person. And this is important. Um, again, we're not believing in a fairy tale. He was a real person. We also believe that Jesus died. Because if we are to believe that Jesus was born flesh and blood, then uh, common sense would say that he died because everything and every person that is born must die. It is a fact. So if he lived, he died. There's no arguing that. Roman and Jewish historians both document the death of our Christ, our Christ Jesus. So we know he was born and he died. And Jesus's burial as documented in the scriptures, is historically accurate. We have said over and over again that the Bible is the most historically accurate book in the world. The New Testament is historically accurate, and there are more manuscripts for the New Testament than any other book, okay? We talked about that, I think, week two or three, and I showed you the chart of all the manuscripts. So we know that the um, burial of Jesus and the various aspects of Jesus's life that is documented in the New Testament is historically accurate. Jesus's tomb was empty after his death. And we're gonna talk about this when we get to the slides titled uh, The Tomb. We know his uh, tomb was empty. In fact, we use the word empty loosely because John actually saw the grave clothes in the tomb and they were in the form of a body, but there was no body there. So the clothes were laid out as if, um, you know how if, if you um, laid out your clothes on the bed, right? And you lay out what you're going to wear. And normally when we lay out our clothes on the bed, we just kind of put it on the bed kind of next to each other or whatever. We don't normally lay out our clothes as if it were in a body like the shoes at this end and then the slacks or the skirt, then the top and then our hats if we're wearing a hat, right? We don't normally lay it out uh, lengthwise on the bed. We kind of normally lay out our pieces. But apparently this is what John saw in the tomb. So he and Peter were racing to the tomb when the ladies told them what had happened and John outran Peter. And when he got there, he looked in the tomb and saw the clothes. So the scriptures record he never went in because what he saw was the clothes laying there in the form of a person, but no person, no body there. And that was enough to convince him. Um, I've got a lot of more research I am going to do about these grave clothes because I'm just completely fascinated um, regarding these clothes and the fact that they were there and he was not. Um, so we know that the tomb was empty and void of a body. Okay, this is the important thing. Um, Jesus physically rose from the dead and was witnessed by many. Okay, witnessed by many. So many doubters were convinced um, of the resurrection and empty tomb based on testimony of the apostles. And we know the apostles witnessed uh, the resurrection of Christ in that they saw his physical body because he told him, remember, don't be afraid. It is I. He told Thomas to touch him, right? So we know that there were eyewitnesses accounts of the resurrected Christ, of his body. We know this was one of the things that was um, one of the criteria for the apostle that took the place of uh, Judas, right? So whoever was going to replace him had to have been a witness of the resurrected Christ, right? So we know um, he was seen by many, not just the apostles. And we'll get to a scripture a little bit later on 
um, of those that did witness um, his body. Sorry, I'm just making a note of something while it was on my mind. Um, we also know the apostles suffered for preaching the bodily resurrection of Christ. So if they did not believe and see with their own eyes that he had been resurrected, meaning that he was alive again after they watched him die on the cross, why would they suffer and why would they become martyrs for someone that they did not believe in? If this were a myth, if this were a legend about Jesus um, having died and then being alive again in the physical body, right? Not just his ghost or his spirit, as some would say. If the apostles did not believe this to be true, and if they had not witnessed this with their own eyes, why would they have been willing to and did die for the cause of Christ? How many of us would die for something that we did not know to be true? No, of course not. Would be tortured for something that we did not know to be factually true. So these are things that were no different back then than they are today. People aren't willing to be abused for no reason. Okay, and this is what happened with the with the apostles. Okay, any questions before we move on? Yes, ma'am, Sister Julie. Um, let's see. I think I'm off. I can hear you. No. Okay. Um, very good. I happen to be uh, uh listening to uh, a, a reporter this afternoon interviewing an uh Palestinian uh. I would say leadership person. Um, I didn't, I came in in the middle of it. And they were, of course, talking about the war. But what I thought was very interesting as we were talking about Islam uh, being uh, uh, close to Christianity and the fact their belief in Jesus, what I thought was extremely interesting is that they discussed during this interview about the war that that the islamic now i don't know if it's every sect but the the gentleman he was talking to they say they also have belief in mary which i was i was i was really shocked about that and uh, especially because of the culture and how women are recognized in their culture but they recognize mary also Interesting. I thought that was real. I have, I want to look into that further myself. I I can't add to that conversation, but it's. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> All right. We're going to move on. Thank you for sharing that though. Was Christ the Messiah? So at least 60, 60 messianic prophecies in the old Testament talk about um, Jesus being the Messiah. All those prophecies were made at least 400 years before Christ was born. So remember, um, the Septuagint was translated around between 150 to 200 BC. And we know there was a 400 year gap of time between the last books of the Old Testament and when Matthew wrote. So um, we know there was 400 years of silence, right, um, when God did not speak. So Malachi and Chronicles were the last books as far as time-wise of the Old Testament, I believe. And if I'm wrong, please forgive me. But I believe they were the, the last books as far as when they were written. And then there was silence. There was nothing. So all of the prophecies from the Old Testament that uh, foretold of Christ were at least 400 years before he was born. This is significant because these prophecies were accurate. <laughs> they were very accurate. So let's look at why is Genesis 3.15 significant? Let's look at Genesis 3.15. Genesis 3.15 says, and I will put in enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. 
somebody tell me what's significant about that verse. That there would always be differences between uh, men and women and um, that part of going back to the garden, I would presume. Mm, not exactly what I'm looking for. I always thought it was had to do with, yes, he was able to uh, eventually have God killed, but God, Jesus rose and still have the victory over him, over sin and death and over Satan. Mm, not what I'm looking for. Thank you. Anybody else? You want me to bring it back up? And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Oh, it's talking the, the, the about Christ. Will be forever uh, God children and the devil's children will be, be out with, forever have conflict. Mm -mm. No, ma'am. Are they talking about when they say bruising his heel? Um, you know, when he was cru when Jesus was crucified, they crucify not through the uh, you know they don't go through the foot, they go. It's actually I think through the through the um, uh, what do you call um, through your wrists and through you know the lower part of your leg to hold the person. So could they have been talking about Jesus when they, about bruising heels and enmity? I thought they were talking about Satan and, and uh, as, as compared to uh, Mary, you know, bruising, mm. him, you know, him crawling on the ground. So you guys are, you guys are talking about the, the scripture, but you're, <laughs> you guys are missing um, the significance of, so we're talking about Christ being the Messiah. Yes. Okay. So let me ask you this. I will, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shall bruise his heel. Um, how many of y'all have children? I do. So yeah. is it <laughs> okay? Do women have seed? No, no. no. We have eggs. Yes. We have That's seed, true. right? So <laughs> women do not have seed. Women have eggs. This scripture was talking about how Christ would come through, through the birth of Mary. Remember, she knew no man. It was just her. So we talk about the immaculate conception. This was a virgin. So she had not known a man. She had not been with a man. So when the scriptures talk about knowing someone, they're talking about sex, right? So through Mary is how Christ was born in the flesh. She had both seed and egg in her, in one. That's how she was able to have Christ. Remember the scripture says, I will put in between thy seed and her seed. Women don't have seed. Women have eggs. This was prophetic of Christ. Yeah, I knew it had to have something about Christ. So can, can we go? I've been trying to be a silent participant here, but can we go back? Sorry, and I'm, I'm going to go back on mute. But so when we look at this scripture, so here, it, this is speaking to Adam, right? Between thee and the woman. So between Adam and the woman and between his seed and her seed, correct? Yes. Yes, and it's also prophetic of Christ coming. It is It is absolutely prophetic of Christ coming. But I kind of just wanted to note that um, the, the um, contention between Adam and Eve here as well, because oh. between him and her, between thee and the woman, so right. between him and her, as well as his offspring and, and her offspring. Right, and it was talking about, of course, the enemy as well. Absolutely. Right. And this is clearly prophetic of Christ as well. And it took a, I, I will tell you all, I've read this verse for years and I did, it took a while before I grasped this as well. 
because when we read it, we just think about, oh, the good versus evil, right? We talk about how um, Adam and Eve um, ate of the fruit and how now they are being punished. But um, it, it takes a while to really read into, and this is why we have hermeneutics, so we can read the scriptures for what it says and read further into it to really realize, wait a minute, women don't have seed. Women don't have seed. Women have eggs. So this is, um, and I don't want to take a whole hour to talk about this scripture because we actually could, but yeah. we look at, again, was Christ the Messiah? And the fact that he did come through the virgin birth, which was also prophesied, um, it just shows the many prophecies that were told of Christ before he came and the accuracy of those uh, prophecies. Now, the probability of finding one man who meets any, just eight of the 60, remember we said at least 60 of the Messianic prophecies of the Old Testament were about Christ. Um, if we, the probability of finding one man who met just any eight out of the six, okay, just random, any eight of those prophecies of the Old Testament is two in 10 to the 17. That is a huge number. Wow. That's a 10 followed by 17 zeros. Okay. That is a very, very small probability of finding anyone to meet any eight of those 60. And that's just any eight. So I took this quote out of our book because I thought it was pretty good. Fulfillment of any eight of the six prophecies proves God inspired the writings to a definiteness which lacks only one chance in 10 of 17 of being absolute. And I think I've made a typo here. It should be one in 10 and 17, not two. Let me uh, correct that right now before I send out these slides. I wonder Sorry what science would have to say about that. It's well, very, that's what, it's a very it's a interesting. It's uh, a mathematical huh? problem. So science has already contributed to that because probability and statistics is math all the way. That's right. And we can also read the Bible from a mathematical point of view. Yeah, that should have been a one. I'm sorry, you all. I put a two there, so I have corrected it because I'm looking at the book now. Okay, so any one in 10, 10 to the 17, so 10 with 17 zeros, that is a very small probability, okay? So if we're doing the math, and everybody knows that math does not lie, math deals with numbers, right. facts, and figures, and um, I've studied a lot of math in my day, and God truly inspired the writings of the Bible because these were exact. These prophecies came out, and they were all true. I put a link here to an article I found, a failed uh, messianic prophecy, and it's actually a, um, a, a video you can listen to. It's very good. Basically, um, the prophecy did not fail, but it goes to um, the arguments some will make against the Bible. And the arguments, those will say that, oh, uh, the prophecies weren't true or they weren't exact. So um, it's a very good, it's a short video as well. It's, I don't know, maybe 10 minutes long. It might be shorter than that. Uh, I've listened to it a couple times. So was Christ the Messiah? And we've got our Old Testament prophecies that do say that he was the Messiah. Um, Jesus had three basic credentials. And this again is from our textbook. The impact of his life through his miracles and teachings. There's no denying that. Um, New Testament definitely uh, talks about the miracles he performed and it talks about his teachings. Matthew wrote in great detail about Christ's teachings, his fulfilled prophecy in his life, the fulfilled prophecy in his life. So again, we talked about the Old Testament prophecies and how they came to pass in Jesus's life right down to where he was born. Um, that was prophesied as well. And his resurrection. So these are three of the basic credentials of Jesus, okay? Is Jesus really God? Here's another very interesting article. Um, 
we know, yes, he was really God. And I've got this scripture here. Look at what Jesus said right before he raised Lazarus from the dead. So we know Lazarus had been dead for several days. Um, and Jesus said, then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that thou hearest me always. But because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. So right there in that statement, and this is right before he told Lazarus to come forth, right there he is acknowledging that he is the Messiah and he's acknowledging that he is talking to the Father, although he says, I, I already know you heard me, but this is for the people so that they will believe that you sent me. So that right there tells that Jesus knew he was the Messiah and he knew exactly who sent him. And he was saying what he did for the people so they would believe. He already knew it, but the people had to believe. The crucifixion. Crucifixion was one of the most cruel and disgraceful forms of torture. It has been said it was the most wretched death. Mm -hmm. um, it was horrific. And by all accounts of the word horrific, no one would want or choose um, to die that way. Jesus was whipped and... The Roman custom, they didn't care about how many lashes he received. So it could have been well over 40 lashes because um, the Romans did not care. Jewish custom had to be less than 40 lashes. And I just realized I put my signs the wrong way. <laughs> my greater than and less than signs <laughs> I put them the wrong way. So the Roman custom, I'll, I'll correct this before I send it out. The Roman custom could have been greater than or equal to 40 lashes, okay? Because they didn't care. Jewish custom had to be less than 40. It couldn't have been equal to. Um, had to be less than 40 lashes. By all accounts, it would seem that Jesus received far more than 40 lashes, the whippings only stopped when the prisoner was near death. So the whippings continued um, until it was deemed that they were just about dead. We know that Christ carried his own cross and this cross weighed approximately 110 pounds. Um, I should have put a space there because it looks funny. We know this cross weighed approximately 110 pounds. So, um, that is the weight of a small individual, a person that he would have carried for however far he had to journey. Okay, this is the same cross that he would later be affixed to. So he carried his own cross that he would be on. His hands and feet were nailed to the cross. Now, normally it was customary to use ropes. And for a very long time, um, there were speculations that the New Testament writers were incorrect when they documented that his hands and feet were nailed. But later it was discovered, no, um, there was a corpse that was discovered that had the nail through their ankles. So it is indeed uh, historically accurate that Christ was nailed to the cross. And if you all look at pictures, um, old pictures of um of um, depictions of Christ, sometimes you'll see that he's tied. I've seen pictures like that where they show um, Jesus tied to the cross with rope. Any of you all ever seen those pictures? Mm -hmm. Nodding heads, yeah. Yeah, and that's because for a while, um, historians did not believe that the, um, the nailing to the cross was accurate because there were so few cases of that but it was later discovered to be in fact true, that he was nailed. Um, the legs of the prisoner were normally broken to speed up death. 
that would cause rapid suffocation or coronary insufficiency. So what it was, um, the the prisoner, while they're on the cross, they kind of um, relax their body, so to speak, because of the great suffering they were doing, right? And so in order to get air, they would stretch out and try to stand on the cross. So there, there was like a foot rest of sorts, and they would try to stretch out their bodies to get air. Well, when they, they couldn't do that if their legs were broken. So if your legs are broken, you can't stretch out and stand because your legs are broken. So that was a way in which the soldiers would speed up death because the prisoner would suffocate or have coronary insu insu insufficiency. However, with Christ, that did not happen. They did not break his legs because when the guards went over to him, they deemed that he was already dead. So there was no need to break his legs to speed up death because they said he was already dead. This goes back fulfilling the prophecy that none of his bones would be broken. And see there, again, prophecies are being fulfilled. This was an Old Testament prophecy that none of his bones would be broken. Psalms 34, 20 says, he keepeth all his bones, not one of them is broken, which is quite miraculous when you think about it. All the whippings that he went through and all the suffering and beatings and things he went through and not a bone was broken. Not even so much as a toe or a finger. I, th I think it's amazing. Simply amazing. Um, but again, I shouldn't think it's amazing because again, prophecy had to be fulfilled. Somebody saying something? Okay. Prophecy had to be fulfilled. It had to happen just as um, the prophet saw it. So not a bone would be broken again. Um, it, it just goes to show that the prophecies of the old Testament came to pass, even in his death, even in his death, the tomb, who was at the tomb of Jesus? Anybody know who was at the tomb? The women. What women? Mary, Ma uh, Mary Magdalene, Mary, his mother, Martha, Mary, and the uh, other Mary, um, were at the tomb. Yeah. Um. The Marys. <laughs> yeah. Ladies were at the tomb, and they went, and um, what happened? Well, they did the the usual uh. Jewish uh, burial ceremony, cleansing the body and, uh, you know, anointing it and putting fresh wraps on the body. After that, the Sunday when they went, what happened? Oh, he wasn't there. <laughs> the, the, the rock was uh, away from the tomb and he was gone. I think that was Mary Magdalene. <clears throat> she was asking, where is my Jesus? And she was yes. spoken to by one of the angels. Yeah. And he has risen. Yeah. Yes. He's not there. That's right. That's right. Yes. Who told him that he wasn't there? The was white angel, I, angel Gabriel. The angel. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say it was Gabriel. Well, Gabriel is the messenger angel. That's, that's right. That's why I kind of assumed it was him or her. <laughs> Yeah, they they're not uh, gendered right. beings. Okay, okay. <laughs> the, the angel, you're right. The angel told him to fear not. Yeah, and that um to fear not, and they sought Jesus, and he was not there, and to go, and that he would meet them right. And then the ladies went off, and they told the disciples because the angel said, "Go and tell his disciples." Right. They and didn't so believe them. They didn't believe them. Who didn't believe? The the men didn't believe them. And so they had to go and see for themselves. And that's when Peter and John went running. Right. Mm -hmm. um, only Christianity claims an empty tomb for its founder. None of the other religions of the world claim that their um, founder or the person that they believe in rose from the dead. Only in Christianity. 
The resurrection of Jesus Christ is one of the most wicked, vicious, heartless hoaxes ever foisted upon the minds of men, or it is the most fantastic fact in history. Think about that for a minute. If someone were to create a hoax, a hoax is something that isn't true, um, kind of like a fairy tale or whatever. If someone were to create a hoax, why would they create one so horrific? Think on these things. Yeah. Soon, there has been no evidence to prove the tomb was not empty. None. No evidence to prove that the tomb was not empty. We know the resurrection of Jesus Christ and Christianity stand or fall together. So Christianity is based on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We believe firmly that Jesus was born, that he died in the flesh and rose. We believe this to be true. This is what Christianity is about. The deity of Jesus and his resurrection. He is God manifesting the flesh. He died and rose. The Jewish community at one point advertised this saying. A godless and lawless heresy has sprung from one Jesus, a Galilean deceiver, whom we crucified, but his disciples stole him by night from the tomb where he was laid when unfastened from the cross and now deceive men by asserting that he has risen from the dead and ascended to heaven. Now, right there, they have identified one that Jesus was alive and a real person, that he had uh, disciples that believed in him, that he was in the tomb Okay, so they, they, they've they agreed that he was born and that he died and was in the tomb and that he was no longer there. So by this assertion that the, the disciples came and stole him, they are identifying that he was no longer in the tomb, that the tomb was empty. And they are asserting that the disciples took him down from the cross and somehow must have placed him in the tomb and stole him. And that they are deceiving others by saying that he was dead and ascended to heaven. So they are uh, addressing and identifying that this is what was being taught, that he was dead and ascended to heaven. They are identifying that he was alive, that he died, and that the tomb was empty. So in putting this out there, trying to make a scapegoat for themselves. And they also said whom we crucified. So they're identifying the part they played in this. Um, they are identifying all the things that we believe. He was born, he died, that he was crucified and that the tomb was empty and that he ascended to heaven. They've said it all right there in the statement. We know this because the scriptures tell us this as well. And we know that the New Testament is historically accurate Matthew 28, 11 through 15 says, Now when they were going, behold, some of the watch came into the city and shewed unto the chief priests all the things that were done. And when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave large, they gave large money unto the soldiers. And these were the soldiers that were outside the tomb saying, Say ye, so they're telling the soldiers what to say after they're paying them off. His disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. And if this come to the governor's ears, we will persuade him and secure you, meaning you're not going to get in trouble for falling asleep on the job. So they took the money and did as they were taught. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. Well, we know Matthew was correct because right above that is the statement that the Jewish community was advertising exactly what Matthew said. Historically accurate. OK, the soldiers were paid off to say they were sleeping on the job and the soldiers would not have been sleeping on the job. Let me tell you that. Um, but they were saying that they slept on the job and that the 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 uh, apostles came and took him away. OK, not true. This is called bribery. 
securing the tomb. So let's talk about this tomb for a minute. There was a large stone placed at the entrance of the tomb, and it was about four and a half feet to five feet high. Okay, I will tell you that I am 5'2 on a good day with no heels. So the stone would have been as tall as I am. So this was a large stone. It weighed between one and a half and two tons. Now that's heavy. This is a huge stone, a stone among all stones, a boulder, okay? The stone was rolled into place and sat in a type of a groove. So imagine the tomb is there and there's like a divot or a groove in the ground to where this stone, when it's rolled down into place, it kind of sits there, okay? And then there was this wedge that kind of held it in place. And I liken it to a doorstop. You know, those little black triangular things that you push up to a door to keep a door propped open if there's not one of those little kickstand things. So the, the boulder was in place and it sat in this groove in front of the tomb. And then there was a little thing there that kept it in place. But that wasn't enough. As if a one and a half or two ton stone boulder wasn't enough to secure him. Remember, there was already an uproar among the people. That's why they took Jesus by night. But that's another story. So they took him by night and started his trial. Um, and so they've got this huge boulder of a stone in front of the tomb. Now, I will tell you, Lazarus didn't have a, a stone that size because Lazarus' stone was rolled away and Lazarus came forth. But that's another lesson. So Jesus' tomb was secured by a, a huge stone, larger than probably the other stones that were used. And then the stone was sealed in place. So there was a type of rope that was stretched from one side of the tomb, of uh, the rock, excuse me, one side of the boulder to the other side, kind of like a bungee cord, so to speak. So it went from one side to the other side. And on either side, that rope was sealed in place by a type of wax. Therefore, it would have been evident if anyone had broken the seal, because in order to move the stone, you would have had to move the seal. The seal would have been broken because the rope would have been moved. So you've got this huge boulder in front of the tomb, plus the rope on the outside of the boulder, and is sealed on both sides to ensure that no one and nothing is breaking that seal. And there were guards outside the tomb. Okay, you've got guards, it's sealed, and it's got a huge monstrous of a boulder type stone in front of the tomb. There is no way the disciples are moving this and taking him out. Okay, just to put it in perspective there. And again, the Roman guards were placed out front. They were not sleeping on the job because they would have had to answer to their authorities. Again, the Roman security were like the best in the land. They're not sleeping on the job. Any questions before we move forward? Just put it into perspective about this tomb that Jesus was in, his body was in. So it is nearly impossible for his disciples or anyone else to have stolen him by night while the soldiers, while the Roman soldiers would have slept. Because I tell you what, if anybody tried to move that stone, they would have made so much noise. If anybody was sleeping, they would have awakened. Yeah. Because there would have been grunting and probably someone getting hurt trying to move that stone. Would you all agree? We're talking one and a half to two tons. There's no one person moving that stone if it's to be moved. But it was actually in Rome, in, in the Rome's, you know, that was their get out of card, you know, jail card. And and for the and for the Jewish, uh, you know, uh, Pharisees and Sadducees and, and their religious class uh, that fed into them not agreeing that Jesus is the Messiah because then they would have been out of a job if he if they declared him so it was a power and a money prestige thing they didn't want to lose their good jobs basically 
oh, with the people. <laughs> but <laughs> they, they they can deny him then, but um again, mm -hmm. once he was resurrected, um, and the the graves were opened and people were walking around who once were dead, uh, that would make a believer out of just about anybody. Right. And that's why they had to put out that story so that the false they, narrative, absolutely. Right. They were they were getting ahead of the truth. Yeah, they were they were trying to, but um yes. again, when when Jesus walked amongst the people and was witnessed by many and the graves were opened, and the older those that have died in the faith were walking amongst the people as well. There's no denying that. Absolutely. The resurrection of Jesus was foretold in scripture. And we talked about that. That's just, there's a couple of scriptures listed. Um, and again, these are just three of many scriptures where his resurrection was foretold. The resurrection is noted, and this came out of our book as well. The resurrection is noted as the explanation of Jesus's death. It's prophetically anticipated as the messianic experience. And we know that because it was prophesied about it was going to happen. Apostol apostolically witnessed. And we know the apostles witnessed his resurrected body. We know that this was one of the criteria for whomever was going to replace Judas as an apostle. So we know one of the criteria when they were casting lots um, when it landed on Matthias, it was he had to have witnessed the risen Christ. Um, and this was important. Um, we know the cause of the outpouring of the spirit and thus accounting for religious phenomena otherwise inexplicable. So there were others that were raised from the dead as well. And we'll talk about them in a few minutes. You can't explain that. These had to have been by the power of God. A lot of the miracles that Jesus performed, and this is why they're miracles, because no one in their flesh or human uh, doing of their own could have done such things. And it certifies the messianic and kingly position of Jesus of Nazareth. This is what the resurrection does for us. There is more evidence for the historical fact of the resurrection of Jesus Christ than just about any other event in history. That's important to know. Why was the resurrection so special? Well, I talked about this a moment ago. There were others in scripture who were made alive after death. So there was Lazarus. There was Tabitha. And I put links to their stories. There were others. There was... Um, the guy, uh, Eucritus, or I can't uh, pronounce his name properly. He's the one that fell out of the three-story window. And I think Paul is the one that brought him back. He fell uh, uh, from, I think it was a window. He fell out of a tree or something. And he, uh, I think Paul brought him back. And then there was um, the little boy in the Old Testament. And um, did Elijah lay on him and breathe life back into him? Um, I may be getting my prophets confused. I think it was Elijah that did that. Yes, that's so, correct. There were several, um, thank you, Sister Aura. There were several um, in the Bible who were dead, but then made alive. Okay, but here's the difference um, with Jesus. So not only did the Old Testament scriptures foretell of Jesus's bodily resurrection, but Jesus also told about his bodily resurrection. He told about rebuilding the temple in three days. Um no physical person had anything to do with Jesus's resurrection. So let's think about that for a minute. With Lazarus, Jesus spoke the word and said, Lazarus, come forth. With Tabitha, Peter is the one that raised her and he told her to get up. Um, Tabitha was Acts 940, but Peter put them all forth and kneeled down and prayed and turning him to the body, said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. So Peter, through the power that he had in Christ, was able to get Tabitha to get up and to, uh, to yet be alive. Lazarus, 
And when he, when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice. And we're talking about Jesus cried with a loud voice, Lazarus come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus said unto them, loose him and let him go. So Jesus told the grave clothes to loose Lazarus and let him go. So Lazarus being made alive, Jesus told him to come forth. So Jesus spoke the word and Lazarus came forth. When Jesus rose from the dead and he, there was life put back into his mortal body, there was no human interaction. No other person had anything to do with his resurrection, with him being made alive after he was dead. This is the difference between Jesus' resurrection and others in the Bible who were dead that were made alive. The tombs that were open after Jesus died, that was from his doing as well. When he was made alive, they were made alive. Any questions about that? Okay. Paul wrote, and that he, and he's talking about Jesus, was seen of Cephas, Cephas was Peter, then of the twelve, after that, he was seen of about 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. And this is Paul's account in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 5 through 8. We know Paul was a very a uh, great writer of the New Testament. And we know, um, I think it was from last week's class or maybe the week before, one of the other Jewish historians said, uh, basically he didn't believe anyone's account except Paul. So Paul was noteworthy and he was trusted in his writings and in his accounts that are documented in the New Testament. Now that doesn't mean that the other New Testament writers weren't any good because that's not true either. We know Luke detailed a lot in the book of Acts. He detailed so much that a lot of his accounts aren't noted anywhere else in the New Testament. He was very meticulous with his writings, as was Matthew and Luke and Mark. Um, but we know the New Testament as a whole, again, has more manuscripts than any other um, ancient writing, and it is historically accurate. Remember also, the Bible is the most historically accurate book in the world. We're going to keep talking about that. Um, the New Testament specifically. So again, these accounts that are noted um, are well documented and are proven. Um, the resurrection was special because it was Jesus and because the apostles said it was special and they witnessed his bodily resurrection. And so did many others witness it as well. And again, there was no person that had anything to do with the resurrection of Jesus. Nobody Physically, no other human person told him to come forth or laid hands on him, his own power. Any questions before we get into your homework assignment? No? Okay. For your homework, each student will submit a presentation to their instructor, that's me, and to the class. You all are going to be making presentations to each other. You're going to be doing what I do. This is what you're going to talk about. How many trials or judgments, right, did Jesus have prior to his crucifixion? How many trials or judgments? So in today's time, that would be how many, how many times did he go to court? Okay, so in today's time, um, we can liken it to... <laughs> Uh, there's a former president who's in the news right now who's got a lot of court cases coming up. This is what I'm talking about. How many cases, how many court, how many trials did he have? Okay. Is everybody clear on that part of the question? I want to know how many trials did Jesus have before the crucifixion? So before he gets to the cross, okay, 
Remember, they came and got him while he was with his disciples. And he says, why are you laying hands on me now? I've been teaching in the temple with you all this time and you never touched me. And now you come out with staves and such. And Peter got mad and cut off somebody's ear. Okay. I'm talking about immediately upon that point when they went to get him. How many trials did he have between that moment and when he's on the cross hanging? Is everybody clear about that question? Any questions about that part of the question? No, so you're talking about real trials and not yes. trials as challenges. Not exactly, not trials <laughs> as challenges. I am talking about he is taken before someone, they are accusing him of something and they are sentencing judgment or they're passing judgment off to somebody else. That's what I'm talking about. He is bound and he is taken to someone and being accused of something and taken to someone who is going to acknowledge that accusation or they're going to wash their hands of that accusation. This is what I'm talking about. How many of those instances did he have? How many of those trials did he have? How many times was he taken to someone for a judgment? Okay. How many times did it happen? And who were those people he was taken to? Pressing the wrong button. And who was he taken to? I want to know the names, okay? How many trials did he have and who was he taken to? Give me the names of the people he was taken to. Were they all Jewish? So were all... No, no, don't answer now. I want you to put it in your paper. I mean, in your... Pro... What you're going to present, okay? Were they all Jewish? If not, tell me what they were, Okay. And then I want you to give me no less than two proofs or two artifacts of a person, place, or thing that is referenced in the Bible. So I want you to give me an example of just two things or people that have been proven that were in the Bible. So it could be a place. Uh, archaeologists discovered this place exists. This was talked about in the Bible in Genesis 1520. Um, I somebody made a video and they've been traveling and they've discovered this. Um, History Channel reports that this has been discovered and this was the stone that was used at this place. And this is representative of the seal on the tomb. This is what that seal would have looked like. So this is the seal that would have been on the tomb. I want to know at least two things that you have researched and found that validate as something that was referenced in the Bible. It could be a person, You archaeologists discovered somebody's tomb. It could be a place um, the city of Nazareth has been found. There's the placard to the city or something. Um, something that is referenced in the Bible that has been validated. I want you to tell me at least two of those things. And do not give me examples that I have already given you in class. Mm -hmm. I have put links to several things in these charts. Do not give me something I've already given you. Each one of you can find two other things. There are 66 books in the Bible and there's a gazillion verses. You can find something. <laughs> how how long do you want the presentation to be? There is no length. You just need to answer the questions and you need to cite your sources. Don't tell me you got it from Google. Don't tell me you went to Wikipedia. Okay? You didn't ask Jeeves either. Okay? You are going to cite your sources you are going, everybody is going to turn in their assignment to me no later than Sunday at 3 p.m. You are going to turn in your presentation to me. You can put it in PowerPoint. You can put it in a Word document. 
You are going to cite your sources and you are going to answer all of these questions. And next week, you will begin yes. making presentations to the class. I will identify and I will let you know who is presenting to the class next week and who is presenting the following week. That's what we're going to do the next two weeks. You will be graded on this. Everybody is going to turn their presentation into me by Sunday at three o'clock. You may not be presenting this week. You may not be presenting till the next week, but everybody's going to turn it in because I don't want anybody turning theirs in after somebody has made a presentation. Mm -hmm. That may be seen as cheating. <laughs> so can I ask a question? Yes, ma'am. So all of the presentations are going to be on the same topics? Yes, ma'am. Because you all are finding... Um, everybody's going, everybody's going to answer the first question, right? How many trials did he have? Who was he taken to for that judgment? Right. And then each of you are going to find at least two, um, proofs, two artifacts, two things that validate something in the Bible. You guys are going to find two different things. No two, you all aren't going to all find the same thing. The Bible is full of uh, people, places, and things. So you all are going to find at least two things, no less than two. You might find more than that and you want to talk about it. Each person is going to present for no less than 10 minutes, though. So you will have our undivided attention for 10 minutes. So we're just... Um, um, be patient with me. We're just... Uh, we're not writing it as a, a regular paper. We're just answering the questions and giving you plugging in information that you want. You can write our sources. It. You and we're going to do it, it orally. We're going to write it and then do an oral presentation to you. Absolutely. You can write it in a Word document if you like. You can do it in a PowerPoint presentation like I have here. You have to cite your sources. Don't give me a paper or a PowerPoint and have no sources. You will miss points. You have to give me some sources. Where are your references? You have to be able to effectively answer the questions I have given you. So you can do it in a Word document if you like. That's perfectly acceptable because when you're presenting it to the class, you're telling the class what you found and what you discovered, what your research has shown. My research has shown that Jesus only had one trial. He was taken before one person and that one person said, yea, verily, you are guilty of sin and we're going to put you to death. That's what my research found. And this is my source. And then the two things I found are A, B, C, and D, and then X, Y, and Z. And they prove that David was a real person and he was short. He stood four feet tall. And oh, look, I found a picture of the slingshot he used. These are examples. <laughs> <laughs> but this is what you would be presenting, right? You're going to tell me how many trials Jesus had and who he went before and what they said. What was the judgment? What did they say? And you're going to clearly talk about that because this is important. We need to know this. We need to know why he had however many accusers, I mean, however many people <clears throat> that were uh, judging him or not and why that's important. Uh, were they all Jewish? This is important too, because Jesus was a Jew. Yeah. Were they all Jewish? Were they not? Don't tell me right now. Do your research. And then you're going to tell me about no less than two things you have found that validate something in the Bible. And there are tons out there. I'll tell you that because I've done my research and I've found plenty. And I was going to do a whole class on it, but then I decided, what fun would that be? You guys need to do your own research. You'll be fascinated with what you find. I can't have all the fun. <laughs> but it truly is amazing to find all these artifacts and all these proofs of things that have been discovered over the years. And there is no shortage of places to find good information on things that have been found in the Bible because it is the most popular book in the world and plenty of people have done lots of research trying to discover uh, what's documented in our Bibles. People want to disprove it, so they'll find things and they may become Christians. I've got a couple books here of people that have done just that, sought out to disprove the Bible and ended up being Christians. The author of this book is one of them, okay? Mm -hmm. 
Um, so there are those who are out to discover and prove the Bible wrong, and they find lots of facts to verify the Bible instead of nullifying it. And then there are those Christians who just want a closer walk with the Lord and want to be so close, they want to find everything they can. We are just researching, seeing if we can find, you'll, you'll present on no less than two. I have no doubt you'll find tons of information because it's out there and I've seen it. Not in person, but I've done my research. Any questions? Everybody, everybody, everybody's presentation paper is due Sunday at 3 p.m., even if you're not presenting. After 3 p.m. Sunday, I will tell you who is presenting on Monday. This is why you have to have your papers in and be ready. Sunday night sometime, I will email you all and tell you who is presenting on Monday. There should be no problem with this because you all are going to be in class anyway. And you will have already turned in your work. So you'll be ready to present on Monday because you're just going to present on whatever you turned in to me. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Yes. If we do PowerPoint, are we going to uh, have to do the screen sharing? Because I'm not uh, clear on it. I'd like to do it but I don't know how to do it. <laughs> you know, the easy thing about that, uh, Sister Aura, when you turn in your assignment, you're turning it into me so I can share it. You just tell me next slide, next slide. I can present it from here. Okay, thank because you. Because everybody's turning in their assignment on Sunday. So I can easily bring up your slides and I can run it from here to show everybody. So that's not a problem. All right, thank you. You're welcome. So again, the format of whatever you're presenting, you can use PowerPoint if you like, or you can use a Word document. I am okay with either way. You have to have sources. You have to identify your sources. You have to answer all the questions that I'm asking you because you are going to be presenting this to the class. You will be graded on this. This is your grade. I am here to help. I'm here to answer questions if you have any questions throughout the week. Um, I did have a couple questions last week that I answered, and that is perfectly acceptable. I am here to help. Again, I did not finish greeting your papers from um, last week. I will finish that um, probably tonight. It won't take too long. I'll either do that tonight or first thing in the morning, but I will finish those. I have looked at two papers. Um, I will get through the rest of them, so that will not take long. I do believe I have received all of them, though. So I do think I have received all of them. I did not send it back an acknowledgement that I received all of them, though, because yesterday was a crazy day. So I just did not get around to it. I did skim through my email and it did look like I did receive all of them. So I do owe you all um, some feedback for your papers for week five. Any questions? Are we citing the resources on the reference page or <clears throat> especially since we're uh, going to do an oral? Do we need to mention it up front before we say what we have to say? How do you want us to, to do that? You do. Um, while you're presenting your material, uh -huh. you can mention your references in the beginning or as you're going through. Okay. Um, you just need to identify it to me. So if you're writing a paper, you need to identify your sources on your reference page like you always do. Okay. So if you're writing a paper, I expect the same thing that you've been turning in. If you're going to do a PowerPoint, just give me one slide that identifies your references. Again, I'll leave it up to you to how you want to present your material, um, whatever you're comfortable with, but you have to answer all the questions. Don't give me a PowerPoint and you've got one slide that says Jesus had two trials and none of them were Jewish. And here's the two artifacts I found. That will not work. You will not get a passing grade on this assignment. Again, I am asking you to talk about how many trials he had, who he was presented before. Give me some details. Why was he before these people? So we had X amount of trials before X amount of people. This person did this. 
And then he went to this person. And then he went to this person. Well, they didn't like him, so they sent him to somebody else. Well, they said, nope, guilty. But then somebody else didn't like that comment, so they sent him to somebody else. I want you to give me the story. And then do a little light reading. Chapters 18 through 20. Which you will have time to do the reading because we're, it's going to take us two weeks to get through everybody for our presentations. I think we've got eight or nine people in the class. So we'll do half of you next week and the other half the following week. So as I don't keep you too long. And that'll take us up through our eight weeks of the class. And we'll discuss um, what we're going to do for our final. This exercise will help bring together why we are good apologists. And this will show the facts that prove what we believe. This is the point of this exercise. As you're researching the artifacts and you're researching the facts that are out there and they, they are out there, this is how you can prove what and in whom you believe is not a myth and not a fairy tale. It has been proven to be accurate because I found this, because scientists have discovered this, because archaeologists found this. This is why this is true. This is why this actually happened or this person actually lived or this place really does exist or this event as noted in the Bible, actually happened because scientists have discovered blah, blah, blah. So that proves this event that is noted in the Bible actually took place X amount of billions of years ago. Does that make sense? Yes. This is how we're good apologists because we're doing the research that proves what and in whom we believe. Any questions? Okay, with that, I'm going to close out in prayer and I will send you all these slides so you all can get to work. I am going to stop sharing my screen. All right, let's close out in prayer. Lord, we thank you for this uh, class this evening. Thank you for all your many blessings. Thank you for opening up our understanding. I pray that you give all of us the understanding that we need. Lord, illuminate your will in us. Allow us to be wonderful apologists that we can spread the gospel to others and that we can rightly divide the scriptures and that we can tell about your goodness with confidence and we can speak boldly in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. All right, everybody. I will see you all next Monday. Okay. Let me know if you have any questions. Okay. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night.